Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Of Interest podcast for 2023. I'm Gareth Vaughan from interest.co.nz. Heavy rain and extensive flooding in Auckland and other parts of the Upper North Island over the past week has put renewed focus on the increasing frequency of such extreme weather. Last year, the government released what it calls New Zealand's first national climate adaptation plan. It looks at the risks and potential costs of climate change and talks about things like managed retreat from high-risk areas. The Climate Adaptation Act is set to follow. The elephant in the room, however, is who pays and how climate adaptation is funded. To discuss this, I'm joined by David Hall. David is Climate Policy Director at TOHA. Late last year, David was lead author of a paper called Adaptation Finance, Risks and Opportunities for Aotearoa New Zealand. Hi, David, and welcome to the Of Interest podcast. Just before we, we get into uh, adaptation finance and uh, climate issues, um, can you just tell us a little bit about um, Toha and um, yourself? Yeah, so Toha is an impact assessment marketplace, so we measure environmental impacts, um, especially with a focus on land use and landscapes and farms. Uh, and then we connect those impacts up to potential buyers of those impacts, um, companies, uh, possibly public organisations who want to see that change in the landscape, want to see those um, changes, whether it's in terms of uh, biodiversity enhancement or emissions reductions or carbon dioxide removals through forest sequestration or water quality. Um, you know, we've got different claims uh, structures in order to record those and then to verify those impacts so that um, buyers know what they're buying. And in terms of the, the adaptation finance report that I mentioned, I mean, it's a very big, thorough report. Um, who did you do that on behalf of? So that was commissioned by the Ministry for the Environment. Uh, so in order to extend the knowledge base um, to support the National Adaptation Plan. And they um, commissioned the Climate Innovation Lab, um, which I was a co-founder of. Uh, and that was a project in partnership with ANZ. And we've been looking over the last few years at different financial innovations and the way that different financial structures and different financial instruments uh, could mobilise um, private capital funding and different sources of funding uh, for climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Great. Well, look, as I, as I mentioned, it's a very detailed report um, and it's a very topical issue given events um, over recent days here in Auckland and elsewhere, Northland, Coromandel and Bay of Plenty as well. So let's start at the beginning. I mean, what is adaptation finance and, and why do we need it? Yeah, so adaptation finance is simply financial flows which um, go towards projects and activities which better align um, Aotearoa New Zealand to its commitments in regards to climate adaptation. And, um, you know, that is one of the commitments under the Paris Agreement. We often talk about the climate mitigation um, commitments under the Paris Agreement that we have to um, achieve net zero by the second half of the century. Um, but the other core commitments are a commitment to climate adaptation and um, setting all countries in the world on a pathway towards climate resilient development. And the third commitment, which is often neglected, is precisely on finance, um, shifting financial flows and redirecting financial flows in order to support those prior objectives of climate mitigation and climate adaptation. So if we're taking the Paris Agreement seriously, then adaptation finance is a critical part of that. And for someone like yourself, you know, sitting there last Friday and again yesterday morning um, here in Auckland, watching that very, very heavy rain pouring down, I mean, what's going through your mind? Um, and and um, I mean, I guess what lessons are there from these recent floods that you take? In events like that, I, I guess I feel a sense of grisly resignation <laughs> that, um, you know, what has been predicted is, is playing out uh, before our eyes. I mean, I was a contributing author for the chapter on Australia and New Zealand for the last IPCC report. And, you know, we collated all of the science and, and um, analysis around uh, the likely climate impacts and adaptation needs. And, 
you know, indeed flood risk and increased flood risk is, um, you know, a major theme there because as the atmosphere um, warms, then it's able to hold more water vapour, about 7% more for every degree of warming. And we've already had more than one degree of warming. And, um, you know, we're on track to two or three degrees warming, possibly more if, if we don't get our act together on the mitigation side. So, um, you know, these risks uh, were well predicted and, yeah. In terms of adaptation finance, is it possible to estimate how much money New Zealand might need for this? It is possible to estimate that and estimates are made um, in the international context, um, especially the adaptation needs for developing countries. Uh, so the United Nations Environment Program um, does them, and they're in the order of hundreds of billions of dollars, as you can imagine, annually. Um, no one has done that analysis of the finance gap in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but the, certainly the climate um, change risk report, which helped to inform the National Adaptation Plan, identified that there was a shortage in the amount of funding and financing that got, was going into infrastructure generally, but also particular infrastructure for adaptation and the other sorts of projects and activities that might enhance resilience of communities to climate-related incidents. Yeah, when the report was released by the government last year, the adaptation plan to be specific, I did get the sense, I mean, I wrote about it at the time, and I did get the sense that the elephant in the room really was how we pay and, and who pays. And James Shaw, as, of course, as Environment Minister, didn't give a lot of detail, but just sort of said it's not all going to be central government. It's going to be property owners, insurers, banks, local government, etc. Everyone's going to have to, 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 to do it. I guess, you know, with your sort of expertise, can you give us a little bit of a flavour of, I guess, where all this money will indeed come from and what forms it, it could take? Yeah, I mean, the, so there's a presumption really that that the government is going to be the ultimate um, backer on this. It's going to be the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And you, you see a little bit of that in terms of the EQC, the Earthquake Commission, um, which is transitioning into a natural hazards commission to, to have a broader mandate. You know, that that it supports uh, people in time of need, you know, after a disaster has occurred. But to you know, enhance our resilience and to make Aotearoa New Zealand a more climate resilient society, we need to do things before people end up in these um, emergency situations or in, and are calling for help. And in particular, you know, if we think what can happen prior, uh, there's different forms of risk transfer. Um, you know, the most obvious example being insurance, where you're transferring uh, risks of losses and damages of your assets onto, onto an insurer. You can also look to um, bring in debt or equity in order to um, enhance your assets and to make them more resilient to invest in the sorts of risk reductions that might um, make them withstand climate related impacts better. And you can also undertake activities off your own balance sheet, self insurance essentially. So, you know, exercise greater stewardship over the assets that you have. And really what we need is a, um, is a system which encourages people to do all of that work. And if we rely too much on government and everyone's expecting government to, to help them when emergencies happen, um, you know, the, the problem is we can dilute some of the incentives for people to um, undertake some of those upstream activities in terms of, you know, exploring risk transfer opportunities and, um, you know, improving the resilience of the assets that they have by, you know, making them more flood resilient, for instance, or, or um, you know, anticipating the possibility of droughts and um, putting in place um, some risk reductions around that. You know, we need to encourage as much of that as possible. So I guess that this money would be used for a wide range of projects. I mean, obviously, managed retreat was one of the big things in the adaptation plan, that this idea that homes or businesses, anything really where there are people, um, heritage sites even, that are in high-risk areas on the coast or in flood zones or whatever, should be moved. So I guess that's one thing that this funding would be used from. I mean, are there other specific areas where we would need to use this money? 
To that example in particular, um, you know, manage retreat is is a real tricky one. And I, and I guess this speaks to some of the challenges for adaptation finance that when you're talking about finance and um, mobilizing private sector capital, you know, they're operating under particular expectations of, of risks and, and returns. And, you know, they need a commercial return on, on investment. You know, that's part of their fiduciary <laughs> obligations. That gets really tricky with things like manage retreat because essentially, you know, you are just accepting losses and forfeiture of particular assets and having to, to move these things upstream. So, you know, obviously we're in, in the space of manage retreat in particular, there's a heavy reliance on, on public compensation. Um, and, you know, the, the state playing a role in order to, um, make some of those moves happen. The financial sector is going to play a bigger role where there is some of those opportunities for seeing a return on investment or um, or improving the returns that it's seen. And I think, you know, one interesting example, um, which is potentially relevant to the recent events, the Auckland flooding, is, is risk-adjusted insurance, where, um, you know, the, the premiums start to reflect the sorts of risk reductions uh, that the policyholder has undertaken to anticipate something like flooding. And it works quite well um, in the example of flooding. Risk-adjusted insurance is not going to work quite so well for things like sea level rise, which are, you know, incremental things. So that's really the space more of managed retreat because there's only so much you can do to stop the sea um, rising yeah. and, and inundating your, um, your, your house. Um, but when it comes to flooding, there is a lot of things that people can do to, to um, you know, reduce the risk of, of losses and damages to their house. And so, um, you know, there's a potential for the insurance sector to um, create an incentive by offering lower premiums if uh, risk reductions are undertaken and those are verified. So it's a little bit like risk adjusted insurance in that in the health um, space where sometimes um you know, there are policies where uh, people have lower premiums if they've undertaken lifestyle changes and so on, which reduce their risk of, of things like heart disease. Um, yeah, so, so, so there's definitely an opportunity um, there. And, and the hope is that uh, if, if, if the insurance sector manages to um, encourage people to reduce risks to their assets, then insurance companies are less likely to face, you know, a massive scale um, call on on claims, um, which could potentially destabilize uh, those companies. And, the, in, you know, when we have these really large scale events, and it looks like the Auckland flooding event will be, um, you know, one of the largest in, in New Zealand's history, you know, it, it, it can really... Um, Put a put a challenge on 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 those insurance companies and their ability to pay out. So it is in their interest to see some of that risk reduction occur, so that um, they're not faced by catastrophic losses of that order. What about um, in the agricultural sector? I, I imagine there would be some opportunities there to, I guess, to help encourage changes of practices and farming te- techniques and that type of thing. Absolutely. And this is something we're really interested in in Toha um, because there's a lot that can be done um, on farms in order to enhance the resilience of those farms to um, to climate related events. And, you know, one of the, the challenges is that agriculture is really highly exposed to climate um, related impacts, whether it is drought or, or flooding events, um, because you're on the land and you're on the landscape and you're reliant on the climate um, changes to the climate can have really um, serious effects, and one of the most cost-effective um, and and practically effective ways to enhance the resilience of a farm is through what we call nature-based solutions. So, using um, nature uh, in order to enhance the resilience of the catchment that you're operating in. So, you might put um, some native bush. In, in your steep gullies, um, and that's going to have the effect of regulating water flows and um, withholding some of the water so that it doesn't all rush into the into the riverways. You might put um, trees on erosion-prone slopes in order to fix the soils and, and make sure that sedimentation doesn't um, and erosion landslides doesn't happen to the same degree. Uh, it could be around... Um, 
you know, even just integrating vegetation um, that uh, can be used, um, that, that, that li- livestock are willing to eat in the event of a drought and if, if grasses, um, you know, are not, are not producing, then um, that they can turn to that foliage. So there's all sorts of ways that you can use um, nature in order to enhance resilience. And often it's going to be not only the cheapest, it's also going to have a whole lot of other co-benefits. It's going to enhance um, ecological connectivity in the region, um, get better biodiversity outcomes, and certainly with some of the farmers that we're engaging with, um, you know, just having that richer biodiversity is good for them in terms of mental well-being and a sense of purpose. Now, in your paper, you outline a, a range of potential funding tools or funding instruments. Um, I'm just wondering, you, you've, in there, you, you also give some examples of, of where some of them are used in various parts of the world. From a New Zealand perspective, are there any of those instruments that that you would see as particularly suitable for New Zealand? And indeed, are, are there some that are already in use here? Yeah, all of those instruments are, are possibilities, possible options that we might look at. You know, perhaps not in the in the short term, but certainly in the long term, if government or if um, private sector decides that these are useful tools, we can start setting in motion um, some of the changes which might help to make those um, instruments commercialisable. Um, but I, I guess with the flooding in mind, some of the ones that really come to come, come to mind are parametric insurance options. Um, you know, presently, we're seeing, uh, you know, we've got hundreds of houses which are red stickered or yellow stickered and an expectation that it could take years potentially to um, clear all of the insurance claims uh, from this particular event. And, you know, I know from my own experience, I I was born and and grew up in Christchurch and so I, you know, know what people went through. And one of the great stresses of that event was um, the challenges of getting a decision around um, house and insur- home insurance um, there, and and the you know the the really prolonged um, uncertainty that that um, that it took for for um, indemnity insurance to be to be cleared. But parametric insurance works instead on on triggers. Um, so it could be the severity of the event if if uh, a flood event reaches a certain level of precipitation. Uh, or if a cyclone, ex, ex-tropical cyclone event reaches a certain threshold in terms of wind speed or or drought um, reaches a certain threshold, then that trigger is is hit and, and a payout is made. And then people can use uh, that money in a multitude of different ways. They don't necessarily need to use it to pay for um, replacement or repair of the assets which were lost or damaged. They might choose to use it um, in order to relocate, for instance. And so not only does parametric insurance have the advantage of being quick, it also has the advantage of, of being flexible and people can use it in a, in a number of different ways. And I think we can already see in Auckland the tension building around people's frustration that they, they've lost everything, uh, they don't have any money, they don't have a home, you know, they're really stuck and in an event like this, um, that quick settlement um, could help. I don't think this is necessarily a replacement for indemnity insurance, but it could be a complement which could um, give people greater flexibility and certain comfort after events like this. And I think another another issue it resolves potentially is just some of that uncertainty around whether government is going to provide relief support or not, because currently governments... You know, they tend to come um, to these events and and offer uh, emergency funding. You know, the government has already done that in the case of the Auckland floods, but it's ad hoc, and no, there's no guarantee um, that that's going to happen. And as these events become more frequent and severe, you know, perhaps governments will be increasingly arbitrary as, as to whether they pay out or not. So, something like parametric insurance would. Um, help with greater certainty, everyone would understand that when a certain threshold is met, that that support is in play. And 
Do you know if local insurers are open to the, the concept of parametric insurance? And also, are there any examples of it being used overseas that you can give us? Yeah, there, there is an example um, which I discuss in the report. Um, it's a parametric micro insurance case study in, in Fiji. So when um, Fiji gets hit by cyclones or, or similar events, it, a, a trigger is struck and a small payout is made to uh, small hold farmers and so on who are dealing with the consequences of those sorts of events. So as I just described, it gives you quick settlement and a, and a bit of liquidity after those sorts of events. So, so there's absolutely is examples. They tend, especially in the microinsurance space, they tend to be in um, developing countries. As to whether the insurance sector is, is open to these ideas, I think their the focus has really been on government and making sure government plays its part, especially in um, preventing further development in flood-prone and um, sea level rise prone in areas which are prone to coastal inundation as the sea lev- as the seas rise. Um, so I'm not sure that th- th- there's much evidence of them exploring those those sorts of options. But um, certainly some of those parametric uh, insurance products might work better for a public insurance scheme. And I hope that as EQC um, moves into the Natural Hazards Commission and it gets that wider mandate and has an opportunity to explore its options more widely than I would hope that that's the sort of instrument that it might look at. Hmm. What's your sense in terms of private insurers and where they're at with all of this? I mean, obviously there's some risk-based pricing that has been introduced in you know areas that are particularly prone to, say, earthquakes, for example, in, in New Zealand um, already. There's been some talk about insurance retreat or, you know, potential development of uninsurable areas, which are, I guess, high risk places where there are continuous uh, problems with flooding or particularly or or inundation from the sea, etc. Is it inevitable that, you know, the government with public money is going to be picking up the bigger slice of the tab? Or do you think that, that there's still going to be a major role for private insurers in all of this? So, so there, there is a dilemma which, which hasn't been resolved. And you can see that government is, is well aware of this and it has been exploring options, but some of them haven't necessarily been very good options. Um, there was a proposal for a, a flood reinsurance scheme um, that was bouncing around um, inside of government. Uh, fortunately, it was um, knocked down by Treasury because you know the, the concept was that government would um, pray, play a reinsurer role for um, insurance companies. But the the unfortunate aspect of that is that it would um, send the wrong signals, essentially, and, and um, create incentives for insurers to keep um, or send signals for development to continue in those sorts of places where, where risk, are high, risk is high. And so... You know, government has got this really tricky balance there as to, as to what role it, it's going to play. It it can't, well, for a start, it can't afford to do um, just just to help everybody um, relocate. If anything, it should be helping the most vulnerable and um, you know disadvantaged communities, the, those with the least capacity um, to do that. And obviously, when we're talking about coastal settlement, settlements. There'll be a combination of those sorts of communities, but there will also be holiday homes from people who indeed do have the means to, um, you know, accept and take that risk on. And so I think there's there's a time where um, the government is going to have to make a decision as to who it's going to support and, you know, does it have the means in order to, you know, provide social solidarity and support to those communities who are least able to adapt um, and then perhaps allow people with the private means to, to live on the beach um, to accept those risks and to enjoy their holiday homes for at least another couple of decades, even if they are uninsurable, they can at least still, um, you know, draw pleasure out of, it, out of, out of those homes while, while the sea is, hasn't quite reached that critical threshold. Yeah, so look, I guess there's going to be a combination here of public and private sector finance coming in and and I mean you know I talking about the private sector insurers reinsurers standing behind insurers they're going to be influential I guess 
Um, also, local government. I mean, you know, local government is is as we've seen in Auckland um, is is a big part of all this as well. Um, and and obviously, their pockets are shallower than 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 the government's. So I, I wonder too, what sort of role, if any, could there be for tax, uh, perhaps as an incentive mechanism in this, subsidies and, and, and grants um, as well? Yeah, I think all of those need to be on the table. And I think, you know, in the, in the report, I discuss um, the duties to pay. And, and I think this comes really to the heart of the question, who has a duty to pay for adaptation improvements. And as I argue, those duties should be treated as diverse, as we've already discussed. Currently, there's an, there's a strong emphasis on a public pays approach where the expectation is that central government will pay for most of this through through funding and grants and, and an investment into infrastructure and so on. But I think we need to take a more um, diverse approach, um, precisely because if, if government's the only payer, then there is these moral hazards and these dilution of incentives, which um, is which, which prevents people from you know taking those risks on board and and taking localized approaches, um, which we ought to encourage. So then there's the beneficiary pays principle, and that perhaps comes to the local government question, where the local beneficiaries of a particular adaptation asset, um, you know, they should pay a little bit more for um, in, into the development of that kind of infrastructure. And that gets you starting to think about different value capture mechanisms. Um, and we don't have too much of this. There's examples of targeted rates, for instance, in, in Auckland, uh, the climate action targeted rate and, and, a, and a water rate, um, which helps to fund local projects. But that's definitely one way forward is for um, a greater use of those sorts of value capture instruments so that the communities who benefit from the particular infrastructure, um, they put more towards that infrastructure themselves and communities that are on the coast are paying for um, those coastal assets um, and people who are up on the hills don't need to, um, don't need to contribute as much. Uh, another principle here is the polluter pays principle, which is very familiar in the climate mitigation space, um, where those who emit the most have to pay the most. But in the adaptation space, um, it gets us thinking about maladaptation. You know, which are the actors or organisations which are contributing to maladaptation, whether it's um, the removal of forest and vegetation from a catchment, or putting developments in harm's way and flood zones and so on. These are all forms of maladaptation, um, laying out impermeable surfaces across urban developments, which, um, you know, make, make a city and an urban space um, less resilient to flooding events like this because it exacerbates the problem of stormwater runoff. Um, so, so there, you know, those sorts of organisations which have reduced resilience around Aotearoa New Zealand through various activities, they might stump up for repairing some of those um, issues. And then the final um, principle really is, is ability to pay, and that comes back to your point around tax, that um, you know some communities are going to have very limited means to be able to... Um, to adapt to climate change and to relocate or to replace assets and so on. And um, we need to look at, you know, fiscal policy as a way to um, enhance that and, and perhaps people who are most able to uh, invest in this adaptation around the country, which generally means those who are more wealthy, um, may contribute a greater amount. You also mentioned philanthropy um, in, in the report, so who knows, maybe some very wealthy individuals might uh, dip into their pockets. <laughs> um, one of the issues, I think, here is that given the, the, the primary value, value of adaptation is, is preemptive risk reduction through preparedness and prevention, thus costs of loss and damages are avoided over long time frames, um, how can we measure whether adaptation finance has been successful and is, is, is money well spent or an efficient use of, of money, especially public money? It, it seems like it's quite a challenge to do all that. 
It is a huge challenge, and this is recognised internationally. The OECD at the moment is is leading some work around what adaptation alignment would look like because, you know, again, in the climate mitigation space, we have these clear metrics for measuring greenhouse gases, and that's increasingly integrated into the economy. Companies can easily measure their emissions and understand how to abate them. But we don't have that comparable framework in the adaptation space. We don't even have, it, even at the international level, an agreed upon set of metrics or indicators um, by which we can monitor and evaluate progress on adaptation alignment. So you're absolutely right. There's some big knowledge gaps there that um, need to be filled and they need to be filled um, at the global level. And that's why when I, um, in, in the report where I talk about um, you know, adaptation finance exists within an enabling environment. Um, it's not going to emerge from nowhere. There's lots of strings that need to be pulled in order to to make it happen. And one of those strings is around uh, research. And I'm not employed by a university anymore, so it, it, it might sound like an academic um, feather in his own nest. But but I'm not I'm not doing that. I think. It generally, genuinely struck me um, when I was doing the report how much we need to learn about risks and come up with better ways of understanding um, how these risks play out in different climate scenarios, what we can do uh, to reduce those risks and what kinds of impacts we'll have and what the cost-benefit ratio of some of those interventions are. And we I, I think government is going to need to take a more targeted approach towards that research and really commission um, research around the particular areas that it, it wants to have a focus on, whether it's particular types of hazard or potentially um, to support the sorts of instruments that I discuss in the report if it decides that one of those instruments is is useful and fills a gap in uh, the policy toolbox then there's specific sorts of data and um, scenario planning and forecasting that's going to be helpful to support an instrument of that and make it investment ready. Um, And so it's going to need to be a lot more um, strategic and and challenge oriented than it currently is with its uh, research funding. Now, obviously, the politicians at the end of the day will be making the the big calls on, on this. And, and it is an election year, and often these big issues get sort of kicked into touch in election years. But you'd think maybe with the, 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 the recent events that we've been talking about, primarily here in Auckland, it might jolt the politicians a bit and the Climate Adaptation Act might proceed reasonably quickly. Um, are you confident there will be some sort of political consensus, I guess, on both sides of, of, of Parliament? Because... I mean, you want something that's going to last, don't you? It's going to survive changes of government. So I imagine you'd be wanting to see that. Yeah, I, I do believe there's strong potential for climate adaptation as a as an urgent issue. I think, you know, it's not just the Auckland floods. There's been floods in Westport, in Golden Bay, out in Te Tairawhiti, um, the you know slash issues there. We are seeing these events hit with greater fr- frequency and severity, and I think most people, most voters, most politicians understand this and and feel that things are changing. And I think um, you know I, I get the sense that uh, climate adaptation is a is a strong issue um, for concern amongst the opposition as well as the government. So. Obviously, I think there's going to be different approaches and probably in some of those principles I discussed earlier around ability to pay, polluter pay, beneficiary pay, public pay, I think that's where we're going to see the differences um, appear because those sorts of principles are going to appeal differently depending on your political affiliations um, and they will give different weights and different balances to those sorts of principles. But I think that's really healthy. You know, that's the right space for democratic disagreement and democratic discussion. You know, we're not debating whether climate change is happening or not. We're just debating about 
who should be paying how much, where the money should be going to. I think that's that's really healthy. And and one thing which strikes me as well is that um, you know the National Party under John Key and but especially Bill English was really interested in this idea of social investment. Um, and that was understood as an actuarial lens on social issues where um, you forecast the potential costs on government uh, and then look to near-term interventions that government could take in order to prevent those costs for, uh, from accruing on, um, on the state and that, that logic just works perfectly for climate adaptation as well, which is no surprise because it is that actuarial way of thinking. And I do hope that um, we get better at that style of thinking, um, thinking where are the, the little intervention points that we can make now which can um, reduce those costs over time. And I think it is a prudent um, fiscal attitude to take, and I think... Um, surely we can get some get some cross party agreement on that that it's that it's better to make those investments now rather than let those costs blow up over time. Absolutely. Well, look, David, I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot more about all these issues, adaptation, finance, and climate change in coming months. Um, that's David Hall, uh, climate policy director at Toha. Thanks a lot for your time, David. Thanks, and Gareth. I'm Gareth Vaughan at interest.co.nz with another episode of our Of Interest podcast. <laughs>